Hi everyone. Obviously asthma is really common in the population and I'm sure you're seeing plenty of asthma in your practices. One of the things that's often underreported and underrecognized, however, is sensitivity to aspirin in relation to asthma and particularly in relation to nasal polyps and allergic rhinitis. Some of your asthmatic patients may describe being allergic to aspirin or not taking aspirin. It's actually not a true allergy and I think it might be interesting just to talk through the pharmacology of this phenomenon and to realise just how common it is. So if you've got about uh, seven minutes, let's talk through it. One of the things we're talking about with this patient is Sampta's triad, which is otherwise known as aspirin-induced asthma. Now, it was recognised in the late 1960s, and it's a triad which shows patients that have nasal polyps, rhinitis or sinusitis, along with asthma and aspirin sensitivity. Now, some authors describe 20%, probably more likely 25 to 30% of asthmatics will have a clinically significant difference in their asthma or deterioration in their asthma in response to aspirin. But it could be up to 50% of asthmatics have some subclinical response. Now, it's more common in women and it's more common in people who have adult onset asthma. And some people have asthma as children and then the aspirin sensitivity kicks in in adulthood. Now the reactions vary in sensitive, sen severity, sorry, not everybody reacts as strongly as others. But when they do react, they react to aspirin and to non-selective non-steroidals such as ibuprofen. Now by non-selective, I mean those that impact on the COX-1 and COX-2 pathways. If you're looking at selective COX-2 inhibitors like rethacoxib, they actually might be safe for some people and paracetamol is usually safe. Now this is a problematic condition, but it actually isn't an allergy. This is not a hypersensitivity. This is to do with the arachidonic acid pathway, the uh, action of aspirin and non-steroidal anti-inflammatories on that pathway. And also it may be a unique feature of some people where it shows the strong role of leukotrienes in their asthma. Let's talk through exactly what I mean. So let's have a look at what happens with uh, phospholipids. Now, I'm not a biochemist, so I've simplified this slightly, but hopefully it should make sense. Phospholipids are changed to arachidonic acid and by the main action of the enzyme phospholipase A2. Now this fellow is going to become a little important a little later on. We'll come back to that one. At arachidonic acid, there's a number of pathways it can follow. And here are the key. So the first is the 5 lipoxygenase pathway which creates leukotrienes. There are a few other steps in the process, but I've simplified that out. Leukotrienes are the main players, the main cytokines for the level of inflammation that you see in asthma and again in allergic rhinitis and nasal polyps. This is where a lot of the mucosal edema, where the mucus production, the swelling and the bronchoconstriction comes from. And this is why Montelukast, for example, as a leukotriene blocker is so effective. The other pathways from arachidonic is mainly the cyclooxygenase pathway, and this includes COX-1 and COX-2. Now the COX-1 pathway is constitutional, and it actually is part of the homeostatic mechanisms of the body. It produces cytoprotective prostaglandins and platelet aggregators, like prostacyclin, thromboxane, and PGE2, prostaglandin E2, which actually is important. It appears in both pathways, and you'll see why in a moment. When you have exposure to inflammation, however, the COX-2 pathway is induced. This is an inducible pathway as opposed to COX-1, which is a constitutional pathway. The COX-2 pathway produces inflammatory prostaglandins, PGI2 and PGE2. And this is responsible for fever, redness, heat, swelling, inflammation. Now, there are other cytokines and other prostaglandins as well, but I've just put the major players here. Now, PGE2 is a little special. You'll notice that when induced by inflammation, it'll actually appear, or induced by tissue damage, it'll appear in the inflammatory pathway. But PGE2 also acts as an inhibitor of 5-lipoxygenase. So as part of the normal homeostatic mechanism, PGE2 helps to keep leukotriene production in check and slows it down. It's an inflammatory break, if you like. So let's talk about drugs and their effect. Steroids are potent blockers of phospholipase A2. Steroids stop the whole arachidonic acid pathway. They act on COX-2 to decrease inflammatory prostaglandins, which is why they're so effective for redness and pain and swelling in anything from eczema to rheumatoid arthritis. 
We know that steroids also block the COX-1 pathway, which is why they can have impacts on some of those cytoprotective and homeostatic mechanisms. They increase your risk of duodenal ulcer because, and gastric ulceration because you lose that mucosal protection that is prostaglandin dependent. They also can have an effect on renal blood flow, which is also responsible for some of those COX-1 prostaglandins. But steroids are also really good at reducing the uh, inflammation and swelling in asthma and allergic rhinitis because they block the lip lipoxygenase pathway as well. So what about aspirin? The non-selective anti-inflammatories act here on the cyclooxygenase pathway. They block both COX-1 and COX-2. Because aspirin blocks COX-1, it stops platelet aggregation, which is why it's so useful in preventing acute coronary syndrome. Because they block COX-1, they also block the prostaglandin effects on the gut and the kidney, which is why you have increased risks of gastric ulcers and why you have to watch renal function. But because they are potent blockers of COX-2, they decrease pain and swelling and fever. But here's where it becomes interesting. There are other things that aspirin and non steroidal anti-inflammatories do. Because it's blocking all production of PGE2, it's not just blocking the inflammatory production, it's also stopping this inflammatory break. So the slowing down of 5-lipoxygenase by PGE2 is blocked, and that means that you actually have more PGE2 available to make leukotrienes, which can make your asthma worse. More leukotrienes, more asthma. But here's the other thing. If we've blocked the cyclooxygenase pathway, but phospholipids are still becoming arachidonic acid, be more substrate to go down the leukotriene pathway. So more leukotrienes produced and less inhibitory action on 5-lipoxygenase. So if you are asthmatic or have allergic rhinitis and it is an atopic asthma or an atopic rhinitis that's really reliant on leukotrienes to drive it, then aspirin and anti-inflammatories is going to make your symptoms and your inflammation significantly worse. So the question then comes, what about COX-2 inhibitors? So things like rifecoxib and celecoxib act here. They're COX-2 selective anti-inflammatories. They'll block the redness, heat, swelling of PGI2, PGE2, but they don't block all PGE2 production. So we still have the inflammatory break mechanism of PGE2 on 5-lipoxygenase. So we still have that slowing down of leukotriene production. The other thing is the whole COX pathway isn't blocked. So you will still get some arachidonic acid going down the COX-1 pathway, which means that you don't overload the leukotriene pathway and you maintain your renal blood flow and you maintain your stomach mucosa. So that's why their side effect profile is low. Does it mean that they're safe for everybody with aspirin-induced asthma? It's hard to know. And certainly the jury seems to be out. In patients that uh, don't have a severe reaction to aspirin, it may be worth trialing. But I would be saying handle with care if you have somebody who has quite severe responses to aspirin. The take home message with this is that this hypersensitivity reaction, it isn't even an, an anaphylaxis. This is just a really interesting piece of pharmacology. But if you have a patient with asthma, and particularly if they have asthma in coupling with um, allergic rhinitis or polyps, chances are they should be avoiding aspirin. And if they haven't tried life without aspirin or anti-inflammatories, it might be something worth a try. It also means that these are the people that are likely to respond well to leukotrienes, follow your normal asthma pathways and management plans, but something else to think about. Hope that helps. If you've got any questions, pop them in the comments below. Bye.